Hi, everyone. I'm Christy. This is Jessica. Hey, everyone. And we are happy to tell everybody about a new virtual exhibit and project called Art the Hard Way, Creativity from the Inside. And we have two artists with us today, Justin and Matt, who are instrumental in putting together this program and this project. And they're going to tell us all about the work that they do, both in the community and inside the federal prison in Florence, Colorado. So Justin and Matt, please tell us a little bit about your program and the project that you're working on. Well, thank you so much for having us. Um, we're really excited to share with the viewers what we've been working on. So Matt and I developed a program called the Creative Arts Platform about five years ago. And so that's a localized program that we do inside the federal prison in Florence, Colorado. And basically what that program is, is a way to introduce creativity to these inmates and kind of expand their definition on it. And so we've done a lot of cool things over the last five years. We do stuff inside the prison. We've done murals, um, full on phases of different uh, curriculum with the inmates. And then we've done some murals in the community and some art exhibits as well. Um, and so this current season uh, linked us with Hard Knocks Gang Prevention and Intervention, which is a nonprofit in Pueblo, Colorado that works with the at-risk youth. And so through some of my graduate work at Denver Seminary, um, I am doing a clinical internship with Hard Knocks and the prison. And so this was a, a great opportunity to, to bridge the two uh, worlds in an effort to try to spread awareness uh, for some of these at-risk youth. Uh, my name is Matt Refik. I'm a local artist here in Pueblo. Um, mostly I paint large scale murals around town. Um, and I'm Justin's partner in the creative arts platform at the prison. And this project just kind of came about through all of that. I've, I've um, been facilitating art programming with him at the prison for the last four years now, um, working on various projects with him. Um, I, I uh, came in through a book that I had published originally um, that was like a uh, kind of a self-assessment coloring book and then I uh, started doing murals and now we just both work together going back and forth between one another teaching uh, creative self-expression really and fostering creative identities for um, inmates in the most highly secured prison in the United States and uh, this is the culmination of one tiny facet of that work and um, it's it's really interesting and it's a beautiful uh, project to bring forth into the community through the Lucero Library and in conjunction with the Hard Knocks Gang Prevention and Intervention uh, and it's really interesting to be bringing this this work out to the to the public uh, particularly at the youth that are you know at risk or whatever word you want to use for it of uh, uh, you know becoming a gang member or uh, you know headed towards uh, prison life. Yeah, that's right. We've done a lot of stuff inside the prison. So this is just a, a tremendous opportunity to bridge that gap. And so a little bit about the theme here. Um, so the exhibit is called Art the Hard Way and uh, Creativity from the Inside. And as we were coming up with this theme, we kind of discovered that we had a lot to say. And so we want to try to do this three times. We want to have a couple more artists talks, if you will, every month. And we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit more about that um, as, we, as we did talk tonight. But about the theme, the first one here that we want to discuss is uh, letters of expression. So a lot of times when, when our inmate participants create a piece of art, uh, with it also comes a short story or a creative spoken word or a piece of poetry, or sometimes it's just a note that they're passing to us facilitators. And so we wanted to try to honor their voices as best we could because they can't be here today. And so a lot, like Matt said, a lot of what we do as a community, um, we, we build trust one another and we, we try to build like an inclusive environment where we can all kind of share that space and, and our love for art and the fact that it heals and we all believe in that and it's, it's certainly a catalyst for change. And so we hope to do that today. So we're going to show, show you uh, some of the art that's been created from March of this year to now. Uh, we just graduated uh, 12 individuals and so we're real excited to, to put their work on display for everybody to see. And with the work we're going to speak life into their words, if you will. So Matt and I are prepared to, to use this platform uh, to honor them. And hopefully their words will, will ring true to some of these, these youngsters that are out there um, that are on possibly a, a similar path or, or just in that state of life where you're, you're, you don't know yourself and you're still discovering who you are. And um, art the hard way is uh, an opportunity to open those doors and just kind of peek into to what's going on in these individuals' lives. 
and a couple a couple years ago, we throw, started throwing around the ideas of um, you know uh, creating messages from the inmates to the youth that we could bring out to the um, to the general public that could reach the youth. Like if they had something to say to uh, somebody that's at risk or to their younger selves, like what would they want to say? So it's it's really interesting that um, the the first the first part of that is is happening right now uh, through this show and through this, this small body of work of you know, uh, just to kind of give you guys a taste of what the program is and, and the power behind it. And uh, we're really grateful to be able to, to show it on this platform. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to go ahead and get started with uh, the exhibit. So again, like Matt said, this is... Uh, this is about 12 inmates uh, work and we've been working with them since March. And so the first thing we wanted to show you and uh, just just so you all know, too, um, the uh, we want to make sure we kind of honor their privacy. So we're just going to use like first initials for each individual. So this this guy is uh, Mr. S. And so one of the packets that we start with in the program is abstract expressionism. And it's it's a it's a packet that kind of teaches them to kind of trust in the process. And so he really uh, took to that by kind of going through um, using the materials kind of in a rough way, but uh, found a lot of freedom in that. And so this is this is a letter that he wrote uh, as a result of the work that he did. And I think Matt's gonna share that. <clears throat> Reddick, you talked about getting those pieces of my art framed, but not knowing if the program can afford to do it. In the end, I plan on sending them to my ex-wife who has a strong spiritual connection to me. She also suffers from the same mental health issues that I do. She was there for most of the incidents. Those paintings are going to help Brandy with her emotions. They'll show her every day that one can be broken but also find beauty within oneself. Let me know how much money I need to save for those frames. Really appreciate you finding me. You're a really great presence in my life. Respectfully, Mr. S. Thanks, Matt. And this is another one of our participants right here. Uh, and what was kind of interesting about this process is they have these little flex pins that they sell in the commissaries in the prison. And so he kind of broke open those and stood on his, his cement kind of bed and just kind of let his hands freely take, you know, the ink word where it was going to go. And so this is, again, just kind of like Matt said, just an example of uh, what is available uh, in, in terms of what we do. Uh, so collaging is another thing that we really uh, pride ourselves in in the program. And one of the things we just love about collaging is it's just such a freeing medium. Uh, just about anybody can feel comfortable and confident to do to do collaging. And so we introduce it relatively early in the program. And so this particular individual uh, is an American Indian and uh, he wanted to reflect his heritage. And so the assignment kind of lends itself to looking at your past, looking at your current your current history and kind of bridging that together through mixed media. And so he, he called this one the three greatest hoods. And if you look here, he's, he's talking about childhood, motherhood, and fatherhood. And he uses these forever stamps, which I think on the street go for over 50 cents a piece. And so when we, we saw this originally, we were like, man, that's so cool that, you know, you used, did you know that you're using those, those expensive stamps? And he was like, absolutely. You know, I, I looked at the currency of childhood and motherhood and fatherhood and, and wanted to try to almost replace the the currency, if you will, because that's something that we talk a lot about in this program too, is, you know, we can't always have them for shows with us or they can't always be present, but, you know, the, the currency they get, the feedback they get, um, the things that they can learn from, you know, showing their work to the public is is a different kind of currency. So uh, we really love this piece and we thought it was just reflective of creativity. What do you think, Matt? Well, like, you know, like, Collage art is such a valuable and important part of the program because it it really gets us into the the ideas of um, you know pulling multiple ideas together and 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 conceptualizing ideas and it, it also is instrumental in the um, the creation of the group projects because so many different ideas are coming together in an effort to um, you know make group projects for the whole prison and so we're able to bring you know various groups of people together from different you know sections of the country different gangs different ethnicities all these things that play into prison life and get them all in harmony through a collaging project essentially which is uh cap in a lot of ways but especially when we paint the murals and do the other group projects it, it's a way that they can start to understand how um, multiple ideas can come together and, and and find harmony within those things so i find you know collage art and the abstract art to be very 
good entry points into the work so that they can find their voice within the program. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love I love what you said about uh, CAP is essentially a collage because it really is. It's this inclusive environment where we create a creative sanctuary where multiple ethnicities, multiple uh, gangs, quite honestly, can be in a room together. Uh, and there's no friction, you know, there's no tension uh, after a while. And it's like, man, what, a, what an awesome message that could carry over into so, other, so many other parts of, of, of life, really. Here's another one right here. Um, this was done by a guy named Mr. M. And he wrote a poem with it, so I'm going to go ahead and read that. The older man says to the younger, I shall lend you a helping hand in building the firm ground which you need to stand. The woman and the man say, love is the healing balm. No more cruel chess, fuse minions entangled from Dante. The kids say, save our planet. Let us get better and elevate above the hurt, above the pain, a better future to obtain. When at the very bottom, you can only move up, progress is inevitable. The only time I know inevitable to be good. So this was really cool. He, he had multiple pieces of paper that he was kind of putting together, um, using stamps to kind of tape them together. And some of the images that you see, we'll, we'll try to provide as much as we can uh, for you know their creativity to expand. And so we'll have little caricatures and cutouts and stuff for them to kind of pick almost like an a la carte menu as we go through. So another really interesting component to, to the art world in general is just the, the genre outsider art. And so we don't have a statement to go with this one, but we wanted to just kind of introduce it to the viewers because it's one of those genres that not a lot of people outside of the art community might be familiar with. And so outsider art is essentially kind of art that's created by people that aren't necessarily quote unquote trained. So, you know, the art world has a tendency to try to highlight about 10% of, of the population and, and kind of com compartmentalize what's, what's considered art, what's not considered art. And so particularly in art history, when you're looking kind of about like the academy and how some of those trends evolved uh, over time, you know, particularly in like the uh, 17th and 18th century, you know, it was about elitism and salon style art. And so if you weren't on the inside, you were on the outside. And eventually that trend caught up with the rest of the world. And outside of art actually became a genre that is actually shown in galleries and everything. And so a lot of the experts, particularly art therapists that work in, uh, you know, the, the penal system or, or corrections kind of consider insider art to be the best kind of outsider art. Um, so this particular piece was done by a gentleman named Mr. A. And he, he actually turned this in for his abstract piece. And if you look closely, he's using, you know, an institutional sponge, you know, down, down here has been kind of assembled. He's got floss kind of holding the whole thing together. Um, he's got, I believe, jelly from the commissary in here. Um, it's just a remarkable piece of outsider art. And so we wanted to just introduce it to the public uh, if they weren't familiar with it, because it's such a big part of how they create inside. I mean, guys will use Kool-Aid. I've seen guys cut their own hair and make their own brushes. Um, they've painted with coffee. Um, they're just remarkable in terms of what's available, right? And I think that's really what, what CAP emulates as well is, you know, you might not have the best brushes, you might not have the best paint, but if you have that innate desire to create, um, you're going to do something fabulous. And uh, we just love seeing stuff like this. Yeah, I think that, I, I think that the outsider art is the most valuable part of the program because, it, at least for me as an artist, because the the level of creativity that goes into their process of just creating art is just it's just magnificent the way that they work around all of their restrictions in order to have some sort of normal life whereas where like i'm a painter i can go to the store and buy paints um they don't they don't have that opportunity so they'll they'll extract the the threads from their clothes that have a certain color or you know there, there's so many things that i don't even understand and they're so complicated but with their time that's how they've they've figured out how to creatively express themselves in ways that are just um you know remarkable like some of the pieces that come out like the way that they'll they'll uh take apart some of their clothes and then re re uh thread it together to make um you know tapestries and and purses and all these things where just like you know the the level of ingenuity is just uh, it's just astounding of of the work that comes out of and i think that as an artist myself that's what i find to be most interesting is how they 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 use their creative minds in order to make their creative expressions without without the resources that we have absolutely and and just knowing you personally matt it's been awesome to see you kind of interject some of those components into your own work 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting how much Cap has transformed me as an artist. Um, you know, like I came in as this particular uh, professional artist, you know, illustrator, and now I kind of just am an outsider artist that is, you know, so heavily influenced by by um, insider art now, you know, and how that has become such a huge part of my life, you know, like, you know, so many things, as you know, the transformations that have come in such a beautiful, loving way out of Cap, just for me as a facilitator, which now comes out to the whole community through outsider art, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, this is another uh, collage. Uh, and so this individual, uh, he openly let us share his story. So he, uh, he suffers from bipolar disorder. And so the kind of demon like uh, image that you see here, uh, he said that reflects his mental illness and the words that he put all around the piece uh, you really can't see them, I guess, in this PowerPoint, but we're going to actually have some of these images uh, available to, to pull up uh, throughout the, the term that we're, we're on here in the next couple of months. There's just, you know, positive phrases, positive words, uh, words of encouragement. And so it was beautiful to hear him explain this particular piece because he said, you know, I can't not have that part of me. It's always going to be a part of me. So it's front and center, right? There's this, there's this kind of... Uh, pretty vulgar, you know, scary looking image here. But then he, I can, I can use to control how I react to that. So he has all these positive words of affirmation uh, in an effort to balance, you know, his mental illness. And I just, I think it's a beautiful expression. And I was so happy to, to an honor to share um, this component because as you, as you may or may not know, just in, in terms of, you know, prisons in America, there's a lot of, there's a lot of mental illness and there's a lot of isolation and, um, you know, these guys are, are, are doing the best they can to, to balance that. And there's tremendous resources available inside the prison for them to, to do that. But uh, art is also a healing balm, like Mr. Dub, uh, M mentioned in his poetry. And so uh, this is just a great example of how art can kind of blend with uh, the therapeutic or the, the uh, healing components to, uh, to art. Uh, and uh, it's, just, it's just an amazing thing to see. And, and to, to touch on the topic of um, self-expression in the prisons, you know, like for, for the four years that I've been doing it, I've been really interested in um, the way that isolation is affecting um, these men. And um, I, 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 in these times of COVID and how we're all being isolated and, and uh, it, it's, it's important that we, we share this now in a lot of ways because art and creativity is a way that these that these people have learned to deal with their isolation and and stay sane and to deal with their own mental health is through these creative processes and um, I, I find that to be really one of the most valuable things that comes out of it is like that self exploration and that self self expression are so important and so valuable in a human's lives whether they're free on the streets or um, you know incarcerated or you know due to COVID, um, you know, locked out in their house or, or being isolated in any way, like the value of creative expression. And that's something that when people talk to me now, like, I'm just like, you know, you just, just be an artist, express yourself. And I've seen it heal a lot of people and I've seen it get a lot of people through the day and, uh, and, and, and really make people, um, be able to deal with their stuff a lot better. Absolutely. And it's, it's a multicultural thing too. Um, you know, as a Christian, I look at it as like the spirit of the flesh, right? I can't outrun that. Um, but we introduce all these different topics, like you know, psychology would say the shadow self. Um, certain musicians would say that's 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 blurry face, you know. So there's this component to to our psyche or this component to our identity, and I think if you can identify it, right, that's that's the biggest issue, like being able to identify what it is you're struggling with. And art is such a beautiful way to infuse that, like Matt said, uh, and a huge part of what we see with the incarcerated, and I imagine with the youth as well. Well, and and it fosters that sense of self exploration, and and that's that that gives opens up the door for creating new identities for yourself. You know, like um, you know, we can talk on days and days of of people we've seen this happen to, but you know, when they start opening up through a creative means, then it, it really you can just see them transform into new people. You know, like and the faces that they wear with not just us as the you know, the cool artist facilitators, but just the other guards and how they foster these new identities. And now they have these new relationships with the entire prison staff because they're no longer just the gang member. Now they're like, they can wear this artist hat in prison, which is like, it's socially acceptable within prison to be an artist. And it's it's a way to bridge pretty much all the gaps and, and heal 
all the disparity between the different groups, not just between the different gangs, but between the, the staff, the, the, the cops and robbers, you know, it like really brings them together and be like, well, y- y- I'm out here in your handcuffs and I'm carrying, I'm, I'm escorting you, but I know you're an amazing artist. And, um, you know, I think that that's just something that's also really valuable that comes out of, uh, of the work, you know, of being an artist. Absolutely. Yeah. Reauthoring our stories through art is such a huge thing. We've been so blessed to see that. Man. That's a great point. Uh, this is a self-portrait, uh, so we, we dab into that a little bit or early on, quite honestly, in the program as well. Um, this individual goes to MC, and so the assignment is kind of linked to one of the uh, uh, the packets on Van Gogh. And so the, the assignment is that we want you to do two self-portraits, one that shows kind of the face you have to wear in the prison. And so if you want to look at that metaphorically, we could argue all of us wear a prison. You know, we're, we're all part of an open prison and we all wear masks, you know. Um, whether we want to admit it or not, right? And so inside of prisons, that's a, a very volatile part of, of the environment is they've got a certain persona that they have to portray on an open yard, right? Or, or something like that. And so, and then the other image we want them to, to investigate is who are you really? And so this individual did that for this project. And the other side of it, we introduced him to Vincent Van Gogh and the relationship he had with his brother Theo and writing letters. And in prison, writing letters is very much alive. You know, you think about the 21st century and everybody has a smart device and everybody's so busy uh, with this, that, and the other, but ultimately letters are very personal, very real. And so we asked them to write a letter to a loved one. And so Matt's gonna share this letter about Mr. C. Dear mom, I'm writing this in regards to these two portraits of myself. I really couldn't see myself anyway. The first portrait I drew is where I think people see me, and that's as a little boy, because everybody I meet, they ask how old I am, and they say I look like a little kid still. And also I feel like I still am, because I'm still in my mind state of thinking I'm young and I'm still learning how to take care of my mind and brain and still learning, still growing to a man, a mindset. Now then, my second portrait I drew to where I see myself, where I consider myself a, as a warrior and I ain't scared of no one and I don't back down from no one and, and as, as I'll fight for our people, always. Also, I feel like I'm half dead, let me explain. Well, I know I'm alive and breathing, but to be honest, I always feel that I'm dead to the world. I feel like that because I hear from no one and I don't see anyone. Also, I've always felt like I got demons that follow me. Well, I just wanted to show you the real me to you. All right, mom, you have a good one. Take care, Mr. C. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, the depth of emotion that you know some of these letters portrays uh, is remarkable. Uh, we also have this self-portrait, and this is uh, Mr. R. And I want to share a little bit about uh, this through his words. He did uh, essentially a short. The colorless champion simply means that I'm, I've given all that I am to the world and made life more colorful. I chose the butterfly because this particular species spends the majority of its life fighting to survive and the transition it undergoes is a representation of its struggle. The butterfly story. One day a man was walking and during his stroll, he noticed a cocoon and a butterfly struggling to get out of that cocoon. So as a kind gesture, the man simply bust a hole in the cocoon so the butterfly could escape. However, once free, the butterfly flapped its wings twice, fell to the ground and died. The man stood there boggled by the sudden tragedy and wondered what went wrong. What went wrong is he robbed the butterfly of its struggle. See, that struggle to break from the confines of the cocoon is a process which the butterfly must experience because it helps build the strength and character of the butterfly's independence and freedom. So when this particular butterfly was deprived of its struggle, the next beautiful transition. Uh, Another area that we'd like to focus on is kind of introspective art. And so obviously 2020 has been an incredible year for the record books uh, and the history books. And so this is another collage. Uh, and oftentimes uh, we'll find that uh, the sociopolitical kind of realm of society will uh, in- involve itself in the creative process. And so uh, this is uh, Mr. D and he, uh, he wanted to kind of um, honor the BLM movement and, and just give it room to breathe. And so uh, we thought this was kind of an exciting piece to, to add to the collection. Yeah, the, you know, like so much of the work is about fostering identity and looking at who they really are and um, not not just the confines of prison life, 
uh, and their gangs and their their former lives before they were incarcerated, especially at the Supermax, where they're not really allowed to participate any, in, in any gang activity or anything, for that matter. Um, it, it's interesting to look at, to see them look in, uh, deep within themselves and find who they really are, what their like real values are, you know, and um, while many of them still value their gangs, they also all value um, their heritages and, and their families and their loved ones. And, um, you know, most of them I find value all of humanity. You know, they walk down these certain paths and, um, you know, they, they make these decisions, but ultimately through, through seeing their introspection, I realized that, um, you know, I've met the people that the U S government deems are the worst on earth. And I, I haven't met really any monsters that this don't have any, any heart. They all have, you know, love within their hearts. And when they start looking for it, they, they really start to become these new identities that we're hoping to foster within all of them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, such a powerful part of, of what we try to try to accomplish uh, in, the, in the cap space. Uh, Matt, did you want to talk a little bit about Meet the Monsters? Um, well, so the way that I came into the prison program in the first place is I had published a book in 2016 called Meet Your Monsters, and it's a self-assessment coloring book. And um, I had self-published it, and uh, Justin came across it, and that was really the um, my entryway into the program. And I started by really... Um, you know, talking about this book that I'd written, which is a 60 page um, book with um, pictures and a self assessment talking about uh, what your what your demons are, what what monsters live within you and what are what are you not confronting? And so it's, it's questions like, what's your biggest fear? And then on the other side, it, it, it asks like, what what when was a time that you were brave? And then you're, you're, it's kind of like a meditative process while you're coloring the picture or doing your own drawing about how um, you can be more brave and confront your own monsters. And it's, it's, it goes back to the introspection, you know, like that's which is a large part of CAP is like, you know, it's not just drawing tattoo flash or, or, you know, cards to send home. It's about really like fostering your identity. And that's how Meet Your Monsters came into the program and really has been kind of a... Um, in a way, a cornerstone of the program because it's it's um, you know my entry point to the program. All the inmates get a copy of the book, and um, it's been interesting to see the the amount of work that's come out of the monster project of, of people uh, addressing their own monsters, which is uh, the image that's on the slide here. And that was his monster, you know, trying to get fast cash, you know, and like that was the thing that he didn't have is he didn't have the patience for it, and he didn't have you know the the ability to. Um, make cash in a more more honest way at the time, so he felt, and that was his monster, and that was the thing that was controlling his life, and you know, and and at some point maybe that served him, and and it got him through what he needed to get through, but then it landed him in prison, and now he realizes that that monster was something that's really dark in his life, and that's a lot of what we try to foster in Cap is is you know looking to see if they can recognize their own patterns, you know, like so, you know, it's it's such an interesting program because we work with psychology, uh, you know, religious services, reentry, pretty much the whole prison. And we, we, we kind of address these topics through an art program from all these different angles. And, uh, and me coming in as a, as a street artist, professional artist, and, and, you know, Justin doing his chaplaincy work and also being an artist, it's, it's really interesting to see um, just all the various works that come out and how it's reflective, not only of um, society and the prison system, but also of ourselves and myself, you know, I, I learned more from the program than, um, you know, that any of them have ever learned, I'm sure, because I get so many varied points of view, especially when we get into topics like what's your monster and, and just the different things that come up out of that program or out of that topic. Yeah, definitely. And what was interesting about this season uh, with it, you know, we're doing uh, the program and then obviously things changed and we had to make so many adjustments. And so a lot of the participants that are that are in this exhibit got a multitude of in-cell activities, like productive activities to keep busy. And so we introduced the book in the middle of what we call phase one, which has the abstract and collage and some of these other things y'all are gonna see uh, today as well. But so it was just it was just awesome to see creativity just take, you know, front center, you know, in their lives and they were getting inundated with all these different things. And so uh, I was really surprised and, and just excited to see so much of the stuff that came out of, of the pandemic. I mean, even though isolation is a part of their environment, um, there was all of us trying to kind of reconcile that as well and try to balance it out in our own lives. So 
uh, this was one of those pieces that came surprisingly in the, in the middle of uh, phase one for us. Uh, this is another introspective example. And this is Mr. R. The unfortunate domestication of our society has caused originality and truth to take a back seat for the fear of judgment and scrutiny. The encouragement to live in one's truth isn't a battle of spirituality, but rather steps towards understanding self-purpose, self-evolution, and most importantly, individuality. Because at the root of every person lives a divine willingness and desire to live freely and peacefully. This element of living allows one to capture every available opportunity that will help transition their fears into undeniable confidence and their false perception into a reality that is unbiasedly enjoyable. And despite the difficulties that come along with the journey, one must always allow the tale of the battle to strengthen them eternally and spiritually because our truth is our foundation of happiness. So this, this particular individual did this piece uh, in honor of a family member um, that was struggling with identity. And so again, just at the very core of, of uh, CAP is there's room for table, there's room at the table for everyone. Like we we, we rarely have topics or, or subjects or, or, or any of the content that we, we have to really uh, question. It's just a, a safe space to create. And once you have these kind of purposeful things that are driving you uh, in your personhood and the things that you value, um, it's just really exciting to watch them progress as they move into these other phases. And so it's a great example of that. Uh, another thing that we do is we introduce them to surrealism. And so surrealism, you know, is a, is a movement that kind of came between the, the world wars and uh, predominantly in Europe. And um, it was right on the cusp of psychology, really using a lot of Sigmund Freud's uh, teaching uh, about the unconscious and things like that. So we introduce them to artists like Salvador Dali and we, we have them keep dream journals for a couple weeks and uh, they can share in a, in a final piece uh, either a dream they had during those two weeks or if they've had a reoccurring dream, um, they share that. So uh, this one, I'm going to have Matt share uh, a note that he that this inmate passed as he as he turned this piece in. Dr. Stevens, this is a dream I've had of me and my boys. It is good, but strange because even though my sons are grown young men, I have always seen these dreams of me coming home to them and they're still babies. My youngest passed on, at, <clears throat> passed on at 21 years old. My oldest is 25 years old. Thanks for letting me share this. Respectfully, Mr. T. Again, it's just uh, these kind of remarkable uh, self-expressions, you know, um, and to see, to see him with his boys when they were young, um, just, it's just an honor that, that they're vulnerable and share these things. This is another dream piece. Um, by Mr. R. In all the dreams, I was able to remember specific things. There's always this reoccurrence of me being free, but still bound by institutional ways. In one dream, I was home, but my shower was an institutional shower. In another, all the room doors were actually cell doors. But in every last dream, there's always the my ego and nerves conflicting in ways that are disturbing mentally. Whenever I'm trying to run away from my street mentality, Pride becomes a burden so heavy that the things I desire appear further and further away from my grasp. Uh, so again, just one of the one of the reasons we um, felt the the desire to to connect with Hard Knocks is um, what what an amazing you know stage for these youngsters to, to kind of like I said peek into the window of of, of the, these men doing art the hard way and uh, uh, just doing nothing but love and respect for the process. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's always so interesting um, in the program, these two pieces especially, but just all the pieces that come out of the dreams and how much it relates to um, life on the outside and now their lack of that and, and what a what a, um, you know an actual dream they're having about it, but what a what a you know a dream that they want to be back on the streets and how the glorification of prison life is like it's so wrong. You know, like that's one thing I find is like even though some of them do their time and they, they, they serve what they're serving and they don't complain about it. They still all would rather be free from prison. It's not, it's not what the TV or the movies sometimes make it out to be. It's all, it's pretty much always bad, no matter what, what level of gangster you are, what level of, of criminal you are. It's, it's, it's always bad. And the dreams always end up being about wishing that they had be free, you know, like that's what their subconscious mind is always yearning for. That's right. And so uh, one of the things we wanted to kind of 
conclude with in terms of the exhibit is one of our uh, featured artists. So just to talk a little bit about the, uh, the phases of the program. So we currently have three different phases. So the first phase is essentially, y'all got to see a snippet of that today. Um, we introduce art history in phase one and in and, and the hopes that their own personal histories will kind of reflect themselves back through the assignments. And as you can see, we've had a lot of remarkable successes uh, in terms of just honest creative expression. Uh, and then in the second phase, we kind of introduce them to like an exploratory. Let's say we have one artist that, you know, really like collaging and they can come up with, we kind of encourage them to come up with their own ideas at that point. Like, okay, cool. So you want to do a series on collage. And so we just kind of meet them where they're at. And then if they say, yeah, yeah I'd like to do a series on collage and these are the themes I'm thinking. And so it really kind of teaches, um, you know, the institutional mentality to kind of take a back seat to, to something else, something bigger, like this emergence of identity that's starting to happen in these individuals making decisions for themselves. Because in the first phase, we, we hold their hands a lot. You know, we, we give them kind of a black and white, um, directive every week this is this is the assignment this is the lecture these are the homework assignments and this is the main assignment uh and what we hope to accomplish you know in, in a in a society where from sun up to sundown you know you you're doing the exact same thing or you're waiting for people to tell you that you can or cannot do something at least introducing the, the idea that you know they do have an identity and they they do have uh, the ability to, to make some decisions uh and so this particular individual has been with us uh, for, for over a year and he's he's um, still in phase three, but uh, phase two, uh, he explored his identity. You know, he started, he was always a really good artist, um, phenomenal at portrait work. And so Matt and I kind of encouraged him, encouraged him to, you know, kind of scale back uh, and, and really look at who he is and what, what could he say? Um, you know, this is a platform and what, what do you want to do with that platform? And so, um, we're really proud of what he's been doing. And this, this particular piece was featured in our last uh, exhibit. We had an exhibit at the Fremont Center for the Arts uh, this summer, and it was kind of the showcase piece. And uh, it's called The Wool Blanket, and it's it's a short story. And I think Matt's going to read this. Um, so I'm excited to hear that. The Blanket, the so-called wool blanket. If you think about it, a blanket may not mean anything to you. Then again, one's man's, one man's trash is another man's treasure, especially if you live in my world. As a baby, my mother would wrap me up with a blanket, so soft. I felt like I was sleeping in a cloud. She made me feel as if the blanket had magic powers growing up. I used that blanket so much it had holes in it. I heard them argue. I would get under the blanket and imagine I was in a space. My sister and I would tell each other scary stories under that blanket. I would have nightmares and I would cover myself from head to my toes thinking that no matter what was scratching at the window, it couldn't penetrate through that blanket. I was like Superman with that blanket on. As a teenager, I got into some trouble with the law. I didn't want to tell the cops anything, so I just made up a bunch of lies instead. They knew I was lying, so they took me in. The first thing they did was ask me for my parents' phone number. I gave them the wrong number, thinking they had, let, had to let me go. And instead, they asked me to strip out of my clothes. I did. This is the first time I went through this and I felt hopeless and ashamed. I was naked in front of two grown men. This was my first encounter with the wool blanket. I covered myself in that blanket. That blanket itched and scratched my body, but I wouldn't uncover myself until they issued me my prison clothes. Once processed, I began walking to the back halls toward my cell. Before I could get there, fights broke out. I had a swollen eye, but I tried to hide it with that wool blanket. That night, the blanket itched and scratched so much, but then again, I didn't want anyone to see my tears in my eyes. I wasn't scared to be in juvie, but I, got, but, I, <clears throat> but I got had gotten busted in front of my mother, and seeing the pain in her eyes messed me up. Juvie became nothing to me. Until I was certified as an adult, the judge decided that I was old enough to go to prison. I was 16 and really didn't give a damn. The cops injured me. I had a hole in my leg. I couldn't walk, so they put me in the single cell in a medical wing. The first thing I saw on my bed roll out was that wool blanket. If I needed a moment to myself, I would get under that blanket and just think. If I needed to scream, I folded up that wool blanket and screamed into it. If I needed to use the restroom and had a celly, that blanket became my wall. You don't want to slam your dominoes on metal. Use that wool blanket. You need a pillow, wool blanket. Not a smell to cops gas, wool blanket. You're in a dorm and you want to, want to mourn, or shed a tear, 
wool blanket. Once I was stripped of everything and had only thing I had was that wool blanket and a Bible. Having that blanket made me feel safe. I never stayed on the ground. I got up and wrapped myself up in the wool blanket. Eventually they brought me clothes, but I was left in the captain's hole, a dark cell with a single window. They sometimes wouldn't cover the whole window so the hallway light looked so bright even though it was only about an inch wide of light. Again, I had nothing. Oh yeah, some clothes and a blanket. Oh, and that Bible. The blanket kept me warm and the Bible kept me busy. Believe me, I read the whole Bible in 30 days. I remember hearing the slide door open and running back to my bunk, hiding under my blanket so they couldn't see me or the book I had. Anyways, the wool blanket may not mean nothing to you, but it means something to most of us in my world. My painting is not about pain or being hurt. My painting is about falling and getting back up. It's about losing hope and having the safety of that wool blanket. That wool blanket can mean anything to you family, friends, cap. I read somewhere that even in darkness, there is light. My painting is not about defeat, but victory. It's about resilience, strength, and most of all, that wool blanket. Still fighting, Mr. O. Thanks, Matt. It's hard to, it's hard to follow that up. That's such an honest statement. And I was gonna say, you know, that, that wasn't said in that, in that short story. Um, but in, if I put on the facilitator hat and, and, and speak for a moment, it, it's remarkable to see uh, Mr. O's growth. Uh, as mentioned before, he came in with, with uh, significant chops in terms of being able to, uh, to create and, and draw these portraits. Um, but to see him evolve into his personhood and really um, reflect back uh, the darkest, most struggling parts of his person um, onto the world, onto the canvas, and uh you know it's very it's very similar as a, as a spiritual person um kind of this orthopraxis you know you're kind of uh once you reconcile the things that you think define you um and you heal from that you're able to stretch your arms out you're able to to help other people and so again uh, highlighting hard knocks and and uh, everything that uh the library district's doing um I hope that you know honest testimonies like mr o um, can reflect back onto some of these youngsters that um, may find themselves lost, may find themselves, you know, amongst the trouble. And um, rather than setting unrealistic expectations, um, you know, you can look at yourself honestly in, in an attempt to, um, to redefine some of that stuff, reauthor some of that stuff. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, you know, Miss Mr. O's story is, um, you know, one of the most beautiful stories and life changing for me in so many ways to see um, his transformation and, and to see what he went through, you know, like not to speak too much on his on him being individual, but it's just it's amazing to see how he he came in as an amazing artist. And he's a you know, he's a rebel, you know, and everything he did was like, about his gang and about that identity of himself. And then to see now what he does, and it's like, this is his truth. Like he actually moved past his old identity, went all the way to his youth, and now he has a whole new identity in prison. And it's um, it's just really remarkable to see. And you know, when, when this piece was first brought into the program, I mean, it, it's definitely one of the most moving works of art I've ever seen in my life, just because we knew him as a person and to see him totally transform. Um, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to talk too much about it personally, but it's it, it's a complete transformation for this for this um, for this young man. You know, he's um, you know he's serving serving a, a very hefty sentence in, sentence in prison for what he did, and uh, he he's really found a new identity for himself. That's not that same person that that earned that hefty sentence. Now he's a really brilliant artist that fosters the creativity in other people in the prison as well. So, yeah, absolutely. And and one of the things that was uh, uh, also really interesting as we we took a institutional blanket a, a snippet of, of an actual blanket that very similar to what you see on the screen and put that in a shadow box and try to portray it next to it um, just to elevate um, even further the meaning and so he did this back in phase two and then so for this particular project with hard knocks uh, what's called you know, so these are these are images that are that are of similar scale and size that all kind of com uh, compile as one piece and so he has untitled all three of these pieces, uh, this being the first. Uh, and this was originally exhibited in the Fremont Center for the Arts um, Brotherhood exhibit that went on this summer. Um, and so 
he left it untitled even for that exhibit because we had already started to talk about working um, with the youth in the community. And so we really didn't understand fully, you know, the meaning behind it. Uh, and that's kind of the beauty of art anyway, right? It's subjective. You can, you know, you bring everything you are as an individual uh, to any piece of art, right? Whether that's music, film, dance, uh, painting, uh, whoever you are as a person, you know, once, once an artist releases a painting into the world, uh, it's, there's a part of it that's no longer theirs, right? It's going to attach itself to other people, you know, hence the whole, whole purpose of this show and an effort to try to help uh, some of these individuals. But so he, he kind of left this uh, a mystery, right, Matt? I mean, we, we kind of alluded to it, but it was exciting to, to see the first piece of this triptych. Yeah, you know, it was most interesting because, um, you know, these pictures, they don't do them so much justice as art goes, but, um, you know, we were left hanging because we knew that he'd moved into this, this wearing this hat of being a deeply expressive person that's telling this, like, you know, to, to me, it's the most articulate story that's come out of um, the ADX, out of the Supermax, because he's telling the, 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 the bare bones of his soul in these paintings. And we knew that he was getting into that because the way that he started talking in class and what, you know, he really took our teachings to, to heart um, and influenced everybody else in the class to do that as well. You know, um, just seeing the wool blanket when that first came to class and then they had all these discussions and we're like, oh man, can't wait to talk about the spoon and you know, like the cups and like the other things that are so meaningful. And like, so when he released this, I was like, oh man, the story behind this is gonna be remarkable. And he, and he wouldn't tell us the story at first. And then uh, when, he brought, when he brought the other pieces last week and I was like, oh my goodness, this is like, one of those you know it's an amazing story as well uh, it's you know on par with the wool blanket and um i'm excited to read the story that he left with this one yeah so this i mean we were kind of left to, to wonder this is you know maybe him reflecting back uh something and that's his cell door and you know you can see this kind of wolf in front of him uh and then he produced this piece of work so this is the second piece to the triptych um and, and again these are being made exclusively for um, this hard knocks mentality that we're, we're trying to, um, you know, look at. And so again, he didn't define much here, um, presented a younger version of himself, you know, without tattoos, um, you know, the appearance that there's, there's some emotion going on there, uh, as, as he, he lets the water fall in the institutional shower. Um, yeah, we were blown away by this one too. And he just turned in the last piece, which is this piece right here and uh, gave us the short story that Matt's gonna read with it. So I'm gonna go ahead and let him do that. <clears throat> life, my life, mi vida loca, as I struggle with my words, I want you to be the painter as I tell you a story of a young man that's about to make an important decision, a decision that will change the rest of his life. Those decisions that are true and our parents warned us about, the road, that bad road, there I was, standing in front of my future. As I approached the wolf, stealthed by my childish thinking, my arrogant ways, blindly without looking back, never afraid, I went down that path creating my own way. As I created this cage, I have been told that I am a less than human. Am I really that wolf? Now my decisions not only hurt me, doing time isn't the hardest part. Watching your family do time with you, breaking their hearts, watching them die inside, that mess is, is hard. You see, your family loves you so much that they'll never show you how truly how they truly feel. But I've seen them not be able to hold their tears back. You destroy your family and friends. Time will rob you of everything. Forget about there's no sunshine. You'll never howl at the moon. And even when the sun is out, you'll live in darkness. You'll die sitting, buried alive. Death is your companion and misery will always be around. I've seen friends die, come and go. This is the best on my road. Now, have you ever missed someone so much that you talked to them in your head or had a phone call that left you with so much more to say or just missed someone that has passed away? You close your eyes and reach out for what's not there. It's like your hands can remember every curve of their face. Even when I mourn, I have to hide. But how can I hide when there's nowhere to hide? Sometimes spoken words aren't enough. You wish you had superpowers and that no matter where they are at, you can feel their touch. I'm not human. I feel nothing. In tune with the world, I paint with a broken heart from a place where time doesn't exist and dreams die. I'll tell you, I'll let you be the painter as I put my pastels aside. I'll let you decide not only on these paintings, 
but on my life, untitled, all my paintings, Mr. O. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, what a beautiful expression. Um, you know, so, so often we try to try to hide from the things that make us most vulnerable. Um, you know, we hide from the things that have hurt us the most. And uh, I think when Cap said it's best, like Matt said, you know, we've we've done our job. I guess when when that community can uh, coexist and in, in that pain together, and that brokenness. Um, it's not something that we can really outrun, regardless of whether we're physically incarcerated or, you know, exist within an open prison. Um, so I, you know, what an expression, what a, what an amazing um, triptych and uh, beautifully spoken there, Matt. Yeah, you know, like to me, this is, um, you know, it's just, it's just a, a glimpse into what Cap is, and I, I know that uh, it's such a personalized experience, and a lot of people can't, will never experience it because it's, you know, a, a very um, you know, personal experience between us and them. And, and but the conversations that we have and, and being able to see the transformations taking place, you know, like when when these pieces come into the program and every single person in the room starts to open up about themselves, uh, which is not something that's really common in, in a prison environment. And they start to, you know, have have their barriers broken down and talk about what they've done and 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 without touching on where they're currently at and their current gang situation, and because we put all that aside, you know, it's not it's not what we're working with. We, we we foster their selves and their artistic selves and their true identities, which all of them have before they were gang members or before they were um, criminals or whatever level they're at. And to see these pieces come in and just to see them for the first time, probably ever, open up about who they are, about who they truly are, and how that can become something that is um, socially acceptable within, you know not just within our group, but it becomes socially acceptable with, 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 uh, within the whole in, uh, prison environment. And we see people having these conversations that are much more um, introspective, even with, with staff. And, and I don't know, like, how much we're affecting, you know, the psychology staff or the other, you know, staff that's evolved. But we, within the group of the arts platform, we see so much tremendous growth and so much open expression that, um, And it, it's truly healing people inside. We, you know, there's no way to, you know, you know, quantify what that is, but we can see it happening. And, and I think that's the value of just sharing these letters and sharing this work because it carries that energy. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, we live in a world where everything is evidence-based um, and art is so subjective and it's, it's so difficult to measure using those components. So uh, as we've evolved as facilitators and, uh, you know, Matt and I, you know, and, and some of the other staff that, that uh, are, are intricately involved in this, you know, we don't know what it holds. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know how long we'll get to do it. Um, but I've come to find strength in, you know, words like Mother Teresa. She said, you know, so you can't feed 99 people. Feed one. And that's really what CAP is to me is, you know, it's a time in my life, a season in my life that, you know, I, I can't predict how long I'm going to be here. And none of us can. And so if we can learn from our own trials and tribulations and our own testimonies of pain and suffering. Um, and, you know, I didn't talk a lot about my story today and perhaps other we can do that, but I truly believe that, you know, that's how things are orchestrated. You know, I, I had a whole decade to, to do exactly what, what Mr. O is doing and what Matt does in his work, which is, you know, put your hurt, your pain, your good, your bad, you put it all in one thing, you know, you put it in a piece and, and you heal a little bit better and that scab is slowly turned into a scar, you know, when that scar eventually heals, you know, you're able to use that testimony to help people. And I, these, these pieces are, are a step in that right direction. And, and again, just hope that, um, you know, those that get to see it uh, leave with more than they left, more than they came with, you know? And so uh, Christy and Jessica, that's uh, kind of the extent of um, what we have in the exhibit. Okay, thank you, Justin and Matt. That was really amazing. And I think one of the most incredible parts of this partnership is the workshops that you are both going to be doing on December 9th and December 16th. So I think in the next couple of minutes, if you could just elaborate a little bit on what those workshops are going to entail. Um, they're virtual. And so I want to let our viewing community know that we will have kits 
that will go along with each one of your workshops with supplies in the kits so that they can work on, on their own um, art, either as they watch the workshop or later on. So take a couple minutes and, and talk to us a little bit about what that's going to look like. Um, well, the first workshop we're gonna do is actually the Meet Your Monsters workshop. And uh, the kit will come along with um, the book, coloring pencils. And in the workshop, I'm gonna walk through um, the creation of a drawing of um, you know what would be our monsters or our shadow self or whatever you wanna look at, something that's introspective, some way that we can have um, you know, kind of address issues within ourselves um, in a you know safe, comfortable way through a drawing, and then um, you know we can color them and and um, kind of create them together. And I, I give you kind of a um, a glimpse at the ways in which we can use creative self-expression to heal and to find our deeper truths and to, and to work find the things that we need to work on within our lives. So. Um, you know, it's, it's, it'll be a basic, it'll be fun. We're going to draw a monster together and um, kind of talk about a little bit of what we do in the prison system and how um, these projects affect people within the, um, you know, the uh, penitentiary system. And uh, it's, it's really fun. Um, the, everybody that gets a kit will get a full copy of the book and, like I said, colored pencils. And um, I'm not sure, I think there's an eraser and a pencil sharpener with them too. So uh, it's going to be a pretty cool kit and should be a pretty fun um, workshop to go through. Yeah, thanks, Matt. And then so the following week on the 16th, uh, we'll be airing one on abstract expressionism. Uh, and so throughout the exhibit that we just uh, showed you guys, we touched a little bit about that. So this is going to be a combination of um, getting to be introduced to some of the heavy hitters, particularly Jackson Pollock. Um, they uh, called him Jack the Dripper um, before he came onto the scene, you know, Again, the process wasn't really amplified. It was always in the back of everybody's studio. And so when World War II happened and, and the, uh, the bombs were dropped, so many people in the world, they didn't know what to do, you know, and they kind of lost hope in a lot of things. And, and this particular movement didn't really want to define, you know, their their compositions. And so they, were, they literally kind of started over and let kind of just like non-representational art kind of showcase what they were doing. And then that process became so much looser too. So no longer did it have to be certain pigments and certain kinds of paint. It was like, no, we're gonna use house paint. You know, Jackson Pollock would, you know, it's not uncommon to find like cigarette butts and ashes in his work because he was he was walking over. He was, he was letting the whole thing kind of encompass the process. So what we plan to do with the workshop is uh, we have packets set aside where we're gonna have canvas. Um, we're gonna have a lot of different medium. We're gonna uh, also have colored pencils and oil pastels, um, some chalk, uh, and we're gonna have like just various things that the inmates in the prison use too, like the little institutional toothbrushes that you wouldn't think you could use as art. If you dilute the water and you splatter, you know, the stuff on the canvas, uh, it creates a certain effect. Uh, and then we also have uh, fun little like little straws. You can kind of blow into a straw and, and create a little bit of a splatter there too. So what we hope to do with that is kind of introduce them a little bit to the history that I just talked about and then uh, just kind of free them up, loosen them up, because a lot of people, they're afraid to, to make the first mark. You know, um, I can relate as an artist is, you know, sometimes you can get that art writer's block where you, you don't want to put a mark down on a canvas or on a piece of paper. And um, I think abstract expressionism is such a beautiful way to highlight um, just that dance that you can have. Um, you know, I'm kind of a big person in terms of just uh, stature. I'm over six feet. And so when I paint, I like to move. I like to I like to gesturally involve myself in the process. And so we're going to do some fun stuff in Matt's studio, actually, and um, kind of just show you examples of that and kind of walk you through um, not only the technical side of it, but also just kind of the freeing side that's very similar to um, the jazz analogy that I used earlier, where, you know, you can be trained in one hand, but then free in the other. And the challenge then is to try to figure out how to balance the two. And so we'll kind of throw all that in there and, you know, get messy, make sure you wear some clothes that you're not afraid to get dirty um, because you might find us throwing paint, you know, all over the wall. So we're, ex we're excited to, to show that to everybody. Wow. You guys, that sounds like so much fun. Um, I like to throw in something really fast for our patrons. These kits are totally free. Um, if they're going to be here at Lacero, so just give us a call and we'll happy to send them out. Um, it's first come, first serve. And I believe that's all yeah. we have for tonight. Do you guys want to say a big thank you? 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys so much. It's been awesome. We look forward to the other talks and the, the workshops. It should be really great. Yay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so All much. Right. And uh, if I could, I have just one other uh, statement from the inmates, and I thought it'd be just an awesome way to to, to end our time uh, tonight. And so this was this was written by Mr. M, and it's a shout out to to the youngsters in the community. And again, I just want to say a special thanks to uh, to Mark Salazar and Hard Knocks uh, Gang Prevention, Federal Bureau of Prisons, um, some of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Megan Stevens, Dr. Paul Zahn, uh, Reentry Affairs, Salo. Um, we appreciate everything you do for the program, and uh, we're, we're very thankful for the, uh, the Pueblo uh, Library District as well. So thank you so much. In honor of tonight, and uh, in closing, thank you. Uh, Mr. M, he calls this controlling anger. A real man controls his anger and does not let it control him. Anger is like a fire. It can blaze. Do not ever let it blaze. Do not get violent. Do not make threats of violence. Master yourself in self-control. Where outside forces cannot manipulate yourself into acting some kind of way into action. Toddlers of two are the most violent segment of our population because they lack control of these newfound emotions, hence the phrase terrible twos. You are not two, don't act two. This is important. If you're losing control, take a deep, deep breath and call time out. Calm down and breathe long, deep breaths. Stop thinking or focusing on what makes you angry. Go, go exercise it off. Do not hurt yourself. You'll feel stupid while healing. A real man controls his anger and does not let it control him, Mr. M. Thank you guys so much. Thank you all. Thank you. And hopefully everyone stays tuned for the next one. Excellent. Bye.